Hello and welcome to the Lieberland Show. I'm your host, Adam J. Carswell, and today I am joined by Matthias Desmet. Really looking forward to this conversation for multiple reasons. I got the the the, the honor and privilege of getting to meet Matthias about two weeks ago. He uh, shared a, a presentation at a group in a group that I'm a part of, and I was like, "Wow, we really uh, need this guy to continue sharing his message with everyone that we possibly can in this circle." So. Um, Matthias spoke to us on the topic of, um, well, I might get this butchered a little bit here, Matthias, but basically it, like mass psychosis, mass hyp hypnosis, the collectivism that's taking place in the world right now and how we can uh, be a source of hope, light and truth during a time where a lot of mixed messages and uh, call it brainwashing are taking place all over the world. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm just going to pass it over to Matthias and if you could kind of just share your background and story briefly with our listeners, and then we'll we'll dive right into uh, how we can make a change in the world. Yes. Well, I'm a, a professor in clinical psychology at Ghent University in Belgium, and I also have a master degree in statistics. It goes without saying that every time, uh, everything I say, uh, I say it on my own authority. I, I'm not speaking in the, in the name of the university. Uh, so... Um, um, uh, the only one who is responsible for his words is me. That's important. The university thinks that I should say that sometimes, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm a professor in clinical psychology. Uh, I usually mention that I also have a master's degree in statistics because that was important uh, as to the question how I um, started to speak out during the Corona crisis, I started to speak out in public space. I uh, I first, I, I just saw the statistics, I saw all the mathematical models that were used in the mainstream media, and I decided to to investigate them a little bit. I, and I immediately got the impression that uh, they dramatically overrated the dangerousness of the virus. And by the end of May 2020, in my opinion, that was proven beyond the shape of, the sh a shade of a doubt um, at that moment. Uh, it became clear that all the models that predicted that huge numbers of people would die uh, in countries that didn't go into lockdown uh, proved wrong. Uh, for instance, uh, the models predicted that in Sweden, 60,000 people would die by the end of May 2020 if the country didn't go into lockdown. And the country didn't go into lockdown and only 6,000 people died. And uh, I noticed from the beginning of the crisis, I wrote some opinion papers, but I noticed that no matter how much I tried to, to show uh, that there was something wrong with all these statistics and models, uh, it didn't matter. People just continued, or, 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 or most people, uh, also academics, refused to, to see uh, the problems with the statistics. And uh, by the end of May 2020, I, I decided to focus on, on a different level. I decided to focus on the question as to what psychological mechanisms can explain why people can become so radically blind to see uh, that there is something wrong with the narratives they 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 buy into or with the narratives they uh, go along with. And it was at that moment that I formulated my theory on mass formation, um, mass formation, which is a specific kind of group formation that indeed explains, that, that indeed leads to very specific effects at the individual at the level of individual psychological functioning. Uh, for instance, it makes people radically blind for the absurdities of the narratives they believe in. It makes people radically willing to self-sacrifice, to sacrifice everything that usually uh, is important to them. And also it makes people radically intolerant for dissonant voices to the extent that in the ultimate stage of the mass formation, uh, the masses typically start to destroy each and everyone who doesn't go along with them. And uh, if we want to avoid that ultimate stage of mass formation, it's extremely important to understand its mechanism, because in that, if you understand that mechanism, you can, you know what you have to do in order for the mass formation to go to the ultimate stage. And, um, well, since then I started to, I wrote an opinion paper on mass formation, then uh, afterwards I gave some interviews on mass formation, uh, and it slowly spread around the world. Uh, and now I, I was invited by Tucker Carlson uh, last week on Fox News and also by, I also visited some, a very, a very controversial person, uh, Alex Jones. Um, uh, and now I'm in the middle of a storm 
like <laughs> there is like in Belgium here every newspaper um uh, yeah is uh, publishing critical extremely critical um articles about me also in America there are people who really um target my theory sure um well so um well, I think the beauty of your theory from what I understand and getting to know you is it's the essence of what you are about is the truth will always prevail. And so mm -hmm. although you may be entering into a, it sounds like a chapter of your life where it feels like maybe a lot of the masses as you're referring to are out to get you. Um, the truth of who you are goes beyond all of that. And I think it's just very evident just from hearing you speak and getting to know you and hearing you talk right here. And, and that's the one thing that I took away from your presentation with us is like, we have, um, a calling to share our truth with the world and stand by it. And if we can mm -hmm. do that, that's, that is how at the end of the day, that is how we break down mass formation from happening. Indeed. Indeed. I also, I think so too. And, um, it's just, I believe that I'm just reading the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi. And it's so wonderful. He calls it the title of his autobiography is experiments on truth. And, uh, he describes how throughout his entire life he uh, has been searching for the truth and how he uh, he's so honest in his autobiography. He just admits all his small uh, characteristics as a human being. Uh, he admits uh, when he lied. He admits when he did things wrong. Uh, it's beautiful to read. And uh, I think we all... Um, he leads by example in this respect. He truly leads by example. I I just, two days ago, I was blamed of lying in, a, in an interview. Uh, the newspapers went through all my podcasts and they, they into detail and they found an example uh, that I gave, uh, an illustration actually on uh, open heart operation, on, on, a, on a, the use of hypnosis as sedation in open heart operations. And indeed, I had made a mistake there. I had made a mistake. Um, I suggested that I had seen an open heart operation with my own eyes. And now, and indeed I didn't. And, and I, exp I, I explained it immediately after the interview, before any newspaper had uh, focused on it. I admitted that on my Facebook page. I said in, in one of my interviews, I have uh, raised the wrong impression. And um, um, now they are... All the newspapers are focusing on it on this one small detail. And I just, I think in such cases, it's just good to just admit that you made a mistake. And that's what makes us human. That's what also in the end makes us very strong. Uh, as human beings, we, yeah, we sometimes have a hard time um, um, sticking to uh, honesty and truth. Uh, although I think it's questionable if you can call it a lie what I did. But anyway, uh, just... If we are honest and always willing to uh, admit things, mistakes we make, we made, we will all we will slowly come closer to a true, sincere, and honest existence. And I think that's the big challenge in the years that uh, are before us now. In a world so, that is dehumanizing, we have yeah. to try to stick to truth speech, to truth telling. Absolutely. So um, maybe without going into too much detail, but just from a very high level. Could you could you share with our our listeners and viewers um, some of the maybe some of the opinions or the worldviews that uh, the masses are are having issues with? Like what what are people um, what are they saying that they have that that they're that <laughs> excuse me for getting this mixed up? Basically, they have a problem with something that you're saying, and to me, it resonates as though whatever you're saying, I actually love it. So, what specifically is it that um, the masses seem to be upset about? Well. There are two kinds of reactions from two opposing sides, I think. In the mainstream, people yeah, uh, uh, just feel a certain aversion for my theory because I, I don't go along with the mainstream narrative and they pretend, they pretend that I mislead people and that I uh, encourage people to, uh, to be against the vaccine and, and so on and so on and so on. So they, 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 yeah, they believe that I'm a manipulator there, that I try to convince people on psychological grounds that they should stop following the mainstream narrative. The latter is true. I believe uh, we better uh, stop with this narrative. 
uh, the former is not true, I think. I don't think that, that I manipulate the people. I, at least I believe 100% in what I'm saying myself. And the other side is, well, some people who prefer to see things very uh, exclusively in terms of a large conspiracy that is going on. Yeah, some of these people reproach me that with my theory on mass formation, I only try to explain certain things on the basis of psychological processes that are rather unconscious, uh, while it's clear to them, or according to them, that everything can be explained on the basis of, well, an evil elite that uh, uh, misleads people, manipulates them, and so on. Which, actually, I never really... Uh, I never really... Ignored. I never really said that there is no elite who uses indoctrination and propaganda to continue this mass formation, maybe even to, prov to, to provoke it. But uh, it's a difference. There is a difference between recognizing that there is an elite who uses indoctrination and propaganda and reducing all problems to this elite and claiming that all evil is situated within this elite. That, that only this elite is something evil. I believe that in the end, the masses and even everyone to a certain extent participates in the drama that is playing, that is going on now. And that to a certain extent and to different degrees, we are all a little bit responsible. And I agree with Solzhenitsyn, uh, who wrote this wonderful book, The Gulag Archipelago, about the, about the origins of totalitarianism. And he also wondered, like, can we reduce everything to a conspiring elite? And his answer was no. He said it would be all too easy to um, to believe that uh, the, the dividing line between good and evil runs between people and that there is an elite that uh, is all evil and there is a population that is not evil at all. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and But he said, we all know that the dividing line between good and evil runs through every human's heart. And I think that's true to, to different, in different proportions or in different portions, but there is some evil in all of us. And if we project, if we situate evil completely outside of ourselves, we maybe neglect in that way, uh, or we maybe fail to recognize this part of evil uh, which we can really do something about, namely this part of evil that is inside ourselves. And that's the reason why I am always hesitant to go too far into conspiracy thinking, not because I think that there are no conspiracies. There have always been conspiracies and there have always been people, elites who manipulate the, always. Well, there are such elites. and But I think it's dangerous if you focus too much on that factor alone that you slowly start to believe that the problem would be solved if we just destroy these elites. Uh, kind of if we could provoke an insurrection or a violent revolution against the elites. And, and this won't work for several reasons. First, such a violent revolution would only destroy ourselves as it would create support in a population and in the masses to act violently, to repress violently the resistance movement. And also, even more fundamental, if it would work, if we could destroy this elite, the same elite would be recreated if we didn't change the ideology that has a grip on the population now. It's a certain view on men in the world, a certain way of thinking that is the ultimate cause, both of the terrible situation in which the population find, finds itself, like it's this mechanist, rationalist view on men in the world, which put the population in such conditions that they became vulnerable for mass formation. And at the same time, it's this mechanist rationalist thinking that created this elite, which believes that it is its holy duty to manipulate everyone through indoctrination and propaganda and brainwashing. And so that's the point, I think. The ultimate, the root cause of the problems we are in is a certain ideology. It's a certain way of thinking. And Unless we change this way of thinking, the same problems will resurface, re-emerge time and time again. So I think if we think of an enemy in this situation, in the first place, we should think of an ideology. And only in the second place, we should think of other people. Uh, that will be by far the most fruitful 
uh, ethical positioning and also strategical positioning. Wow. Wow. A lot, a lot that I have to unpack there um, <clears throat> in our, our time. I think this is definitely going to be a part two uh, interview series. So I'll be following up with you after we, we finish our time here today on, we'll call it part one for now with Matthias. But one thing that you also shared with our group that rings strongly in my head, and you could help kind of elaborate on this probably better than I could, but um, the ideology that is kind of taking over the world the people who are generally speaking, not always higher educated, whether it may be a master's degree, doctorate degree, or have finished some form of education beyond call it high school, those actually become the individuals who are mo more susceptible to the mass hypnosis that's taking place right now. What is the reason for that? Because I find that super compelling. Yes, that's a good question. Well, first and for all, that's just an observation. Uh, several... Uh, of the most prominent uh, scholars on mass formation uh, in the field of mass formation have remarked indeed that uh, the higher the level of education, the more vulnerable people are. What the explanation is for that observation is, is harder to say. Um, it could be that um, our educational system, our education system, just fails to make people think for themselves that education and, and schools and so on rather learn people to think all in the same way to accept uh, a certain dogmatic knowledge mm. that could be one reason another factor that might play a role is that uh, people who feel the need to uh, um, get university degrees phds and so on that those people are typically people who uh, give a lot who 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 uh, who want to to conform to social ideals, to social ideal images, who are more conformist in nature, just who try to establish their identity uh, through identification with certain social ideal images, such as having a high degree or having university degree of having something that might also be a reason. It might be that the educational system just forms people, makes pe make people, makes people uh, uh, more conformist, thinks in the same way, or it might be that the educational system selects the most conformist people. That's also a possibility. So uh, there are several possibilities there. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it seems like it was not always that way either. There was some type of breaking point, if I had to guess, and this is just... <laughs> me with the with with no nothing factual to back it up from what it looks like though probably somewhere between the 1940s or 50s up until now is when higher education went through a transformation where now um it's it's just not what it once was no yes that's possible that's say? possible yeah, yeah. Yeah. We should study the history of the education system for that but yes yeah okay fair fair statement fair response so no. um yeah, Matthias, this has been, I, I feel in many ways, we are just scratching the surface on this conversation. Um, so us at, here at the Lieberland Show, we will be following up with you. Thank you for all of all of the work that you've done up until this point and for you standing firm and speaking your truth, because it really inspires me to go out and, and do everything I can to help those around me and in my circle. Um, what was the name of your, your publication again? And, and is there anywhere that you would uh, recommend for viewers and listeners to go learn more about you? Uh, the, the name of my book is uh, The Psychology of Totalitarianism. It's published by Chelsea Green, and it's available on Amazon on the one hand, but also on the website of Chelsea Green as well, and in several other bookshops. Uh, it's available around the world. It's being translated now in 10 languages, I think, and there are other languages that are, uh, there are other countries that are very interested as well. So uh, it's must be why it's widely available. It's now available in Dutch, English, and Italian, and it will soon be available in a series of other languages as well. Uh, people can follow me at my Substack. Substack, uh, just on, if you uh, search for search for Substack Matthias Desmet, then you will find my Substack page with several essays that I wrote, and I I, I write new essays every week. Um, so uh, well. Awesome. That's where people awesome. can find me. And on my Facebook page, people can follow me as well. Love it. 
Love it. Okay. Well, there you guys go. Um, if you missed that, just hit that the rewind button on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to. Go back 30 or 15 seconds and, and catch Matias's information. Matias, thank you for investing your most valuable resource with us here today, your time. Uh, again, thank you for all you're doing to impact this, your circles and the people around you. And let's keep spreading the truth, man. Yes, we will. And thank you very much for inviting me, Adam. And sorry for being late. I was in a traffic jam in Belgium, which is a uh, which happens from time to time. Belgium is a terrible country in that respect. Uh, well, so. Well, uh, hey, it's all good. Because, because of the traffic jam, I think this is going to be a two-part series as I, as I keep advertising. Oh. So I'll, I'll follow up with you Pretty and well. then we'll, we'll bring you back on soon. Thank you, Matthias. Very well, Adam. Bye-bye. All right, everybody who's tuned in, thank you for listening to the Liberland Show. I'm your host, Adam J. Carswell. We were joined by Matthias Desmet today. Go check out his information in the description in the show notes. Thank you for tuning in and we will catch you in the next episode. All right.